I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall. This week and every week throughout the season, we'll be showing you all the best pro football action from the preceding Sunday's games. And in the Western divisions, there were some interesting results on opening day, Tom. How about Denver's win over Cincinnati? Well, that's my old Mile High City. They think they have a great club out there, and they tell me that Floyd Little has really put it across to all those Denver Bronco players. Were you surprised that Cincinnati wasn't able to put more points on the board than that? Yes, uh, Anderson is the only quarterback right now that Paul Brown has. I think that the Bengals are a better offensive team than they showed, but... My gosh, the Broncos have Charlie Johnson. Charlie's playing like he's about a third-year quarterback. And Super. they've got a fine young running back in Otis Armstrong in case anything does happen a little. So they look like a better football team maybe than we thought they were. And maybe at home with that mile-high altitude, that's not bad, too. Could be. That's an advantage, I guess. You're darn right it is. How about Los Angeles beating Kansas City? Now, I happen to see this one, Pat. Uh, uh, Chuck Knox has an offensive line that's second to none. They just cut the Chiefs down in their tracks. It was unbelievable. Is it still that veteran offensive line that they've had for years? Yeah, but they're playing even better. I would imagine Cowan all the way through Young Williamson graded out 100. They really blocked mm -hmm. the Chiefs. How about the two running backs that had outstanding days? McCutcheon is blazing fast, and it looks to me like Bertelson just does it like a football player should. They're very good. In fairness to the Chiefs, though, in spite of the fact that they lost this opener, which I think was a surprise to a lot of people, they did have a lot of people hurt. They're a better football team than that, too, I think. Well, Dawson's thumb has to get well to make Hank Strand move on offense. That's true. And the other one? 62-7, <laughs> to seven, Atlanta over New Orleans. How do you account for something like that? You know, I'm afraid that Van Brocklin has finally come up with a real good defense. Uh, he's been building that way, and uh, I think he thinks his defensive club can turn another team upside down. You know, Tom, I was passing through Atlanta, oh, sometime during the preseason, and the Falcons, as you know, hadn't settled at that time on a quarterback. Uh, they looked uh, very shaky, and Van Brocklin's position, very frankly, I thought was a little bit shaky best, based on reaction from the fans and what I read in the papers, but uh, maybe he was just lying in the bush and waiting. Well, that's true. They're a real aggressive team right now, and Archie Manny had five interceptions. They gave Archie a tough day. They'll be tough. What about our featured performers of the week, Tom? These legs belong to our AFC West outstanding performer, and they carry Floyd Little, number 44, for the Denver Broncos. This footage is from last year's outstanding year. Floyd had knee surgery last year, postseason surgery. A lot of people wondered if he would be back, but off the performance against Cincinnati, he's just as good as he ever was. He's not a monstrous back as far as size. He's only about 196 pounds, about 5'10", but he just seems to make all the natural moves. Floyd Little, who is not only an outstanding football player, but a fine young man, was recently admitted to the University of Denver Law School, and he'll begin study following this season. In the NFC West, let's pick all of Norm Van Brocklin's Falcon receivers. And boy, he's got some good ones. Ken Burrow in his third year, Wes Chesson in his third year, and his tight end Jim Mitchell in his fifth year. That's a pretty good group, and they were all outstanding last week against the New Orleans Saints. I guess nobody knows more about catching the ball, or at least throwing it, than Norm Van Brocklin. Looks like he's drafted the right people to do the job. Mitchell could be the best tight end in football. Went to the Pro Bowl last year, and he's extremely strong and a great blocker, plus being able to catch it. Not only able to catch, what a runner he is after he catches. Jim Mitchell, number 86. He is outstanding. In the past three years, the Oakland Raiders have failed to come up with a win in their opening game. Hoping to finally break the three-year jinx, the Raiders opened the 73 season against the Minnesota Vikings. Minnesota quarterback Fran Tarkington was coming off a great preseason, in which he led the Vikings to five wins against no defeats. Oakland signal caller Daryl LaMonica had witnessed the defeat of his Raiders by the Vikings in the third preseason game. And he found little, if any, yardage early against the Purple Gang. When the Oakland quarterback went to the air, the Purple People Eaters really put on pressure. LaMonica was stalked, hurried, and flushed out of the pocket by the front four consisting of Carl Eller, Bob Lertzema, Alan Page, and Jim Marshall. The 
With the Vikings leading 3 to nothing, Tarkington found John Gilliam for Minnesota's first touchdown. The Raiders rallied on the legs of number 44, Marv Hubbard. Two George Bland of field goals narrowed the score. The Raiders specialty team gave Oakland their first lead of the afternoon. George Atkinson's 60-yard twisting punt return gave the Raiders a 13-10 halftime lead. In the third quarter, Daryl LaMonica went for broke. Mike Ciani's super reception was ruled dead at the Minnesota 30, and the Raiders were threatening again. With second goal at the Minnesota one, Oakland battered three times against the stiff Minnesota front wall, but never penetrated. A third George Bland of field goal lengthened Oakland's lead. Behind excellent protection, Tarkington brought the Vikings back, teaming up with number 83, tight end Stu Voigt. Tarkington capped the six-play drive, finding first-round draft choice Chuck Foreman for the go-ahead score. <music> Following an Oakland fumble, Tarkington called on number 30, Bill Brown for the Minnesota clincher. Monica's fourth quarter efforts wound up buried under a wave of purple shirts. Minnesota 24, Oakland 16. The Oakland Raiders move on to play the world champion Miami Dolphins this week, while the Vikings will travel to Soldier Field in Chicago to battle the black and blue division Chicago Bears. The Philadelphia Eagles and the St. Louis Cardinals may not be prime divisional challengers, Pat, but with the noise coming from Philadelphia's Vet Stadium last Sunday, you'd have thought they were both in the Super Bowl. With two new head coaches and major personnel changes on each club, both teams are out to answer a lot of questions about themselves. Over the years, Philadelphia fans have come to regard the simple act of standing up and cheering appropriate only for certain occasions. But with a new head coach and Mike McCormick, they were all out to see the new-look Eagles. Instead, they witnessed the explosive debut of rookie coach Don Coriel's St. Louis Cardinals. The Big Red had no hesitation about starting rookie Terry Metcalf. With 133 yards and 16 carries, he left little doubt that the Cardinals now have a bona fide game breaker. Coriel also brought a new pass consciousness to St. Louis, and Jim Hart, the quarterback, finally seemed at home. On the ensuing kickoff, six-year veteran Al Coleman had some difficulty feeling the ball, and the Big Red were knocking once again. Donnie Anderson's second touchdown made it 14-zip for the visitors. Capitalizing on a poor punt, a bad blitz, and a rookie defensive cornerback, Hart hit Mel Gray on a flag route. With only seven minutes of the first quarter gone, St. Louis had 21 points on the board, and it looked like it was going to be a rout.
Roman Gabriel's mouth tells a lot about the renovated Big Red defense, but in spite of his muffled call, he rallied the Eagles on his second half turnabout. Ten plays later, the ex ram signal caller found Harold Carmichael unattended in the end zone. field goal made it 24-16 and suddenly the momentum was starting to swing. With less than six minutes remaining, Gabriel rolled right and connected with Tom Bailey to move within one point of St. Louis. But for all the thunderous encouragement the Philadelphia fans rained down on the Eagles, it just wasn't going to be, as the Cardinals moved out of range with a field goal and a Donnie Anderson gallop to make the final 34-23 St. Louis. One of the sports magazines recently ran a story headlined, Break Up the New York Giants. Well, I don't know if they're quite that good yet, but last Sunday they sure enough broke up the Houston Oilers. Thus far this year, the New York football team has truly roamed the land as giants. They were only one of two teams to finish the preseason undefeated. And with the Houston Oilers in town for the opener, the giant star was in ascendancy. From the beginning, even the properly executed Oiler plays were met with obstinacy. Giants' Ron Johnson, number 30, a 1,000-yard rusher last season, was off and running toward another great year. Ron went for 96 yards and two short touchdowns early in the game, and the Oilers had to play catch-up ball through the air. But for Houston quarterback Dan Pastorini, the air was filled with cobwebs, and the spider made quite a catch. Spider Lockhart's interception was one of four that the Giants picked off, and three of them led to points on the scoreboard. Norm Sneed was displaying the same form that made him the NFL's leading quarterback last year and the comeback player of 1972. Sneed's scoring pass to Don Herman combined with Ron Johnson's touchdowns to give New York an insurmountable 27-0 halftime lead. In the third quarter, the Oilers produced a mild gusher of activity as they spurted through the air for two touchdowns. Pastorini to 10-year veteran Dave Parks put the first Houston points on the board. Then Dan Pastorini unleashed an impressive 49-yard strike to double-O Ken Burra to make it 27-14. score was the last the Oilers would get because the giant stalking party led by number 64 John Mendenhall tracked Dante down, capped his gusher, and went on to win impressively 34 to 14. Tom, it looks as if the Bears and Bobby Douglas are as crazy as ever. <laughs> the weirdness even spread to the computer people, Pat, as the Dallas Cowboys, usually precise, meticulous, blew their cool in the Windy City. After losing just one preseason game, were the Bears faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive? That is the question optimistic Chicago fans wanted answered.
Unhappily, on opening day, the mascot seemed to throw better spirals than beer quarterback Bobby Douglas. While the passing offense proved non-existent, there was room for improvement on ball handling finesse. Six times, Bear backs fumbled, so Bobby Douglas took matters into his own hands. And once Big Bobby hits his stride, linebackers' knees begin to wobble. While Douglas is a punishing runner, Cowboy quarterback Roger Staubach is not. Escape, not collision, is his trademark. The Bears' trademark is stringing you out on an iron-armed clothesline. History teaches us that we can learn from our past mistakes. Roger learned that the closest distance between two points is not necessarily a straight line. Setback Calvin Hill carried 31 bone-wearying times for 130 yards, and it appeared he too needed a compass to locate the right direction. With the score tied at three, Staubach decided to end this nonsense, so he lobbed a scoring shot to new cowboy Otto Stowe, number 82. The lead ballooned to 17-3 when Roger connected with Bob Hayes, who last season failed to catch a single touchdown pass. The diehard Bears rallied when Ike Hill returned Marv Bateman's punt 59 yards. <laughs> On the first play of the final quarter, Carl Garrett squirted through Dallas to tie the game at 17. With six minutes left, the Bears gambled on fourth and one and lost. The fake punt did not fool Dallas rookie Billy Joe Dupree, number 89. Dupree's play was converted into a Tony Frisch field goal, and Dallas won 20-17. While Chicago and Dallas were trying to outbumble each other, the Chargers' Mike Garrett committed a season's worth of turnovers against the alert, rapacious Washington Redskins. With old glory fluttering and the sun warming a field of green, it was a perfect day for professional football. Mike Garrett, the Chargers' premier running back, trotted out to make peace with the Redskins and happily thought of the touchdown he promised to score for a friend back in San Diego. The touchdown came the third time Garrett carried the ball. Unfortunately for the Chargers, it was burgundy and gold-clad Berlin Biggs, number 86, who rang up six for the Redskins. Disaster struck Garrett the next time he touched the football. Running a circle route, Garrett took John Unitas' pass but fumbled, and Ken Houston, number 27, recovered. Washington capitalized on Larry Brown's roughhouse run and led 14-0. Garrett sat out a series, then came back to redeem himself. As number 20 steamed off tackle, it happened again. Number 23, Brig Owens scooped up the ball, and in the first quarter, the score read Chargers nothing, Mike Garrett 21. Although San Diego gave up 38 points, the blame did not rest with its defense. They held number 43, Larry Brown, to a mere 24 yards, and the Redskin team as a whole to 83.
The most devastating charger was number 79, defensive tackle Coy Bacon, who broke down Redskin plays before they began. But while the defense held up, the offense did not. The man wearing the shiny blue high tops and the familiar number 19 could not cope with the well-knit Redskin defense. The most persistent thorn in John Unitas' game plan was number 64, Manny Sistrunk, who often engulfed both blocker and ball carrier in his brawny arm. The old master often fell before ferocious Washington blitzes, led by Chris Hamburger, number 55. By game's end, the over-the-hill gang looked fresh, while the grand old quarterback looked every bit his 40 years. The Redskin offense was flat for most of the game, but all it took was a stumble, and number 46, Frank Grant, had a touchdown. By game's end, the mighty Redskins owned a 38-0 shutout over San Diego. George Allen and his merry band of ice cream men had taken their first step in search of the Super Bowl. In the AFC Central Division, this is the year. Paul Brown said, give me five years and I'll bring a champion to Cincinnati. Well, the Bengals opened on the road last week in Denver, and the Broncos put a big dent in Paul Brown's timetable. Despite threatening skies and a lackluster preseason, the fans came to Denver's Mile High Stadium to see their charged-up Broncos tangle with the Cincinnati Bengals. On Denver's first series, Charlie Johnson got things moving by giving the ball to number 44, Floyd Little. Johnson then looked the defense away, turned and hit Floyd with a screen pass, good for 18 yards. The ball was marked dead at the one, and one play later, Little gained Denver's first touchdown of 1973. On the Broncos' next possession, Floyd got things moving again with a 16-yard sweep around left end. Nine plays later, Charlie Johnson gave to Haven Moses on a reverse, and Denver led 14 to nothing. The Cincinnati Bengals then sustained a drive of their own, and when number 19 Essex Johnson turned the corner, it looked like seven. But Johnson had tripped off that tightrope at the 10, and the ball stopped right there. Four plays later, Cincinnati was forced to turn over the ball on downs when Booby Clark, number 35, was derailed short of pay dirt by Dale Hackbarth. when the Bengals' rush failed to put Johnson away, he found number 33, Joe Dawkins, for a 34-yard gain. The Broncos' Mr. Big, Floyd Little, punched the final yard out for a 21-3 halftime lead. Cincinnati spent most of the second half marching up the field, but managed only one touchdown on this 22-yard run by Essex Johnson. The Bengals came close only one more time, and the Broncos had a scare when Ken Anderson dropped a perfect pass to Chip Myers in the end zone. But Myers could not control it, and when he bounced off the fence, he was more embarrassed than hurt.
After sustaining two 80-yard drives and a 72-yard drive in the first half, Floyd Little began a fourth-quarter effort to consume the clock and secure Denver's 28-10 victory over the powerful Cincinnati Bengals. Little himself contributed three touchdowns, 132 yards of total offense, and one pep talk. After the game, Little said, this is my team. If I can't get them up, nobody can. And so Denver has a leader, as well as undisputed possession of first place in the AFC West, and 13 weeks left to prove that all they needed was a leader. We'll be right back with the second half of this week in pro football following station identification. The Cleveland Browns were the AFC wild card team last year when they won 10 of their last 14 games. Their success was almost mystical in that they don't do any one thing particularly well. Maybe it's habit, Tom, because last Sunday the Browns started their bid for playoff berth number 19 against Baltimore's Kitty Corps. Last year, the Browns finished high in the AFC Central. This year, Nick Scorch and company feel that a perch high atop their division is not an unlikely prospect. Beginning the game, number 30, Ken Brown, a pro who did not attend college, showed you you don't need a degree to turn left end. After two years on the bench and a full season under fire, Mike Phipps is getting close to being considered a top echelon quarterback. On this touchdown pass to Frank Pitts, he shows how much poise is a function of excellence. Although the Browns scored first, Bruce Laird of American International College took the kickoff and brought it back 51 yards. Starting his first rookie game, the Ruston, Louisiana Rifle, a.k.a. Bert Jones, quickly tied it up with a shot to Cotton's fire. Bert's debut wasn't about to be that easy, however, and he found himself sacked five times and throwing one costly interception. Number 22, Clarence Scott, made this move to give Cleveland a little breathing room at 17 to 7. The Browns' lead was narrowed when number 88, Ted Hendricks, spiked this punt and recovered it in the end zone. Hendricks' big play put the Colts back in the contest. And the few remaining veterans on the team, like Rick Volk and Mike Curtis, knew that they had to contain the Browns' attack. But the indomitable Phipps came right back to spark a 15-play, 68-yard drive. Phipps then found Frank Pitts at the flag, defeating the recouping Colts on opening day, 24-14. Mike Phipps and the Browns got off to a pretty good start, but this week they faced the new power of the AFC Central, Tom, the Pittsburgh Steelers. You watched them last week, and they are a power indeed, aren't they, Pat? Last week they showed the pretty good Detroit team that they can do all right even without any miracles from Franco Harris. Last week, for the first time in their history, the Pittsburgh Steelers entered a new season as a reigning champion. Without Franco Harris, Terry Bradshaw showed his arm more often than in the past, and Detroit's Lim Barney was waiting. Three times the Lions' Greg Landry fell into the same trap, twice near the Steeler goal line. After a sluggish first half, Terry Bradshaw finally brought some life to the Steeler attack early in the third quarter. A five and a half minute drive culminated in Bradshaw's sneak unique. Temporarily, Pittsburgh led by a comfortable 10-0 score. But just one minute later, Greg Landry found a quicker route to the end zone.
84 yards later, Ron Jesse put the ball down. After three quarters, it was tied at 10. But early in the fourth quarter, Bradshaw and tight end John McMakin untied it spectacularly. McMakin's clutch catch put the Steelers up by seven. And with time running out, the Lions were forced into desperation measures. Lim Barney's run from punt formation failed. Bradshaw added some frosting with a touchdown to Ron Shanklin. And the rugged Steelers now haven't lost at home since season before last. Looking to extend their win streak from 17 consecutive victories to 18 in regular season play, the Miami Dolphins took on a fired-up San Francisco 49er ball club in the blistering heat of the Orange Bowl. Amid 96-degree heat, the San Francisco 49ers invaded Miami, seeking to dethrone the Super Bowl champion Dolphins. It was the first regular season game ever between the two clubs. With middle linebacker Frank Nunley leading the charge, the 49er defense held the powerful Dolphin offense in check during the first half. It seemed as though all the early breaks were in favor of the upset-minded 49ers. Frank Nunley's interception of a deflected Miami pass set up a San Francisco field goal. Miami matched the kick for a first quarter deadlock. Garrow Yepremian's second field goal, this one for 53 yards, broke the deadlock. Number 12, John Brody, brought San Francisco back despite heavy Miami pressure. Tight end Ted Qualick's reception gave the 49ers a first and 10 at the Miami 15. Three plays later, number 22, Vic Washington scored for San Francisco. With Miami trailing at the end of the third quarter, fullback Larry Zonka got the Dolphins in gear. With a third down at the 49er 10-yard line, quarterback Bob Greasy got the protection he needed, and the Dolphins tied the score. A field goal on the ensuing drive put the Dolphins out in front 16-13, and the no-name defense took over. Even the 49ers specialty team scored for the Dolphins. Garrow Yepremian's fourth field goal brought the score to 21 to 13, giving the Dolphins their 18th consecutive win. There are many who believe that Chuck Fairbanks' football team last year at Oklahoma was one of the finest college teams ever put together. And there are many fans in New England who wish that Chuck Fairbanks had brought some of his big red Sooners to open this season for the New England Patriots in Foxborough. For dashy new head coach Chuck Fairbanks, the road ahead is long, the way unclear, and there are many pitfalls. But he will never forget his first Sunday when he led his cohort of New England Patriots into action against the Buffalo Bills. With Jim Plunkett passing and talented rookie Daryl Stingley catching, New England began to move early. Then Plunkett connected with number 31, Josh Ashton, for a big gainer down to the Buffalo seven-yard line. Sam Bam Cunningham, number 39, capped the 90-yard drive on the eighth play, but New England failed to convert the extra point. And on the very next play from scrimmage, Buffalo took the lead 7-6, simply by giving the ball to number 32, O.J. Simpson. 
Simpson sailed for 80 yards, beginning a record-shattering performance of 250 yards gained on 29 rushes on a day when the Buffalo game plan called for him to serve mainly as a decoy. The Bills head coach Lou Saban planned to force New England to adjust their defenses to stop O.J. and then to exploit the resultant weaknesses with his new running back, number 38, Larry Watkins. Simpson's success made his plan doubly effective and beginning the third quarter, Watkins burst for good gains up the middle, setting up his own four-yard touchdown plunge and making the score Bills 17, Patriots 6. But on the next series, Mac Heron, number 42, completed an 80-yard drive in 11 plays, sweeping 10 yards to make the score 17 to 13. In the fourth quarter, O.J. Simpson was still having success sweeping to his right, and this 22-yard touchdown put Buffalo back in control. Jim Plunkett nearly got it all right back when he found Mac Heron alone down the sideline. But Heron stepped out of bounds, and after that, the Patriots' attack stumbled with a good deal of help from the Bills' Walt Patelski, number 85. Without the ball, the Patriots were faced with what for them was apparently the impossible task, stopping O.J. Simpson. O.J. just kept sweeping right and running right into the record book by breaking Willie Ellison's single game rushing mark of 247 yards. At length, when the play was more than adequately set up, a counter give to Larry Watkins produced the Bills' fourth touchdown. Watkins himself gained 105 yards on 18 carries, and the Bills collected a total of 360 yards rushing, accounting for Buffalo's 31-13 opening day victory over the New England Patriots on a day when O.J. Simpson earned much more than the game ball. For the Los Angeles Rams, the 1973 season is one of newness. And although they began it far from home, they couldn't have asked for a better way to start their season of changes. The Rams entered Kansas City's Arrowhead Stadium resplendent in new uniforms, respectful of their new coach Chuck Knox, and redolent with confidence in their new quarterback John Hadle. However, amidst all this newness, there were some oldies, but goodies on the Los Angeles defense, which held the Chiefs to 40 yards rushing on 21 attempts. Lawrence McCutcheon, number 30, is one of the new faces on the Rams, and he introduced himself with 120 yards rushing. Keeping pace with McCutcheon was the fine old second-year vet Jim Bertelson. Bertelson had 143 yards on the ground. And when the runners got him in close enough, John Hadle lobbed a mortar shot into number 88, Pat Curran. Following that, Hadle laid one in softly on Larry McCutcheon, and the Rams were never headed. The Chiefs, without the injured Lenny Dawson, just couldn't get going number 64 Jack Reynolds turned this Mike Livingston pass all the way around. Reynolds' run back got the Rams in close enough for a new look field goal by holder Steve Priest, number 20. 
And in the new look game plan, a field goal will get you six and a 23 to nothing lead. Finally, X-Ram Pete Bethard pumped the Chiefs up long enough for two late scores. But it was not enough to overcome the new image of the golden-clad Rams, who held on to win 23 to 13. The Rams look very good in their opener, Tom, but this week they face an early showdown with the new tough guys of the NFC West, the Atlanta Falcons. That's right. I don't know what my old buddy Norm Van Brocklin fed his birds last week, but I have a feeling it must have been birdseed mixed with buckshot. There was no way anyone in New Orleans could have been prepared for the kind of opening day new coach John North and his Saints had awaiting them. Archie Manning did deliver a touchdown pass to Bill Butler. But for the rest of the day, Archie and his replacement, Bob Davis, had a somewhat difficult afternoon. Claude Humphrey and his Atlanta Falcon friends had an old-fashioned southern picnic, running back fumbles and intercepting passes, six in all, one for a lightning score by cornerback Tom Hayes. And then there was number 11, semi-forgotten taxi man, Dick Shiner. Art Malone was devastating with a downfield pass or with a goal line blast. But last week, Dick Shiner's favorite Falcons were his wide receivers. One of them, Wes Chesson, number 81. Dick Shiner's other wide receiver was dangerous Ken Burrow, a master of the delayed spike. One score was called back, but on two other occasions, Shiner made sure that Burrow could demonstrate his spiking versatility. In all, 10-year veteran Dick Shiner hit on 13 of 15 passes and three touchdowns. 38 points later, Shiner was replaced by number 19, Bob Lee, who completed four of seven. The final touchdowns were credited to unsung names like Eddie Ray and Joe Prophet. Despite six fumbles and two missed field goals, the Falcons still managed almost 700 yards in total offense and an eighth consecutive victory over New Orleans, 62 to seven. Well, let's get on with it. What about your picks for this week, Pat? Well, let's start off with a pretty tough one, San Francisco at Denver. At Denver, that may be the key, you know. What do you think about uh, Nolan's team now, San Francisco? Well, uh, last week against the Dolphins, they played, uh, I think, a pretty good first half. It looked like a solid football team. But once Brody left, they just sort of fell apart, not only on offense, but on defense as well. So I don't know. I think they're still a question mark. They still need a running back, don't they? They have not been able to get a running attack going for almost as long as I can remember. I don't believe Denver can block that real good front four, though, for San Francisco. I have a feeling the 49ers will bounce back. I'll go with San Francisco. All right, I'll pick Denver then. Okay. Atlanta at Los Angeles. That Ooh. looks like a good one. It is. I saw the Rams, as I told you, beat Kansas City. I, I think Los Angeles will settle out there, and I think they'll beat Atlanta. Even after the Falcons scored 62 points against New Orleans. Well, that's right, and Dutchman's going back to the West Coast. I know it, and he's got some not-so-fond memories of the West Coast. I'll go with Atlanta then. Okay, and I'll go with the Rams. Miami at Oakland. Well, the Dolphins seem to have put it all back together after those uh, two late preseason losses. They look solid again against San Francisco, so I got to go with Miami. You know, people are saying this, but Don Shula's got to be a very, very complete coach. I'll have to go with Miami, too. All right, you got him. At any rate, we'll be back next week to show you what happens. I'm Pat Summerall. And I'm Tom Brookshire, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>